know, because when you're trying to get the ball rolling, you know, you're going to push really hard. And so um, I'm kind of expecting everybody to give $500 away this week. No, no, okay, I'll make it easier for you to kind of get the ball rolling a little bit. Okay, first, grab your phone, take out your phone. Uh, that's kind of fun in church. Um, if you're on that Facebook thing, you know what that is. Um, you didn't have to silence your phone for this. Just go on Facebook, go to One Hope Toledo, and if you go onto that site, that little video will be right there at the top. What I want you to do is share that. And when you share that, I want you to say, oh my gosh, the pastor is so cool. Um, or, or you can say, yeah, Josh has got an amazing beard and he's so handsome and has a cool tattoo. Or you could, or the other guy's, well, he's cool too. Uh, something. <laughs> but go ahead and share that. And I think even from last week, just hearing about people thinking, okay, uh, they're doing this. And, and we did crazy things last week, right? We, we went and um, dumped cash on people who got pizza, right? Have you ever, have you seen that video, right? It's a box of cash. That's like, that's more fun to say than almost anything. Say that with me. It's a box of cash. I want that as my ringtone. I mean, I just love that. And uh, somebody uh, on social media wrote back and he ex used an expletive. He said, that's fake. There's no way people give boxes of cash. And so we're trying to track him down so we can give him a box of cash. And he just, he will go, no way. Seriously, 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 seriously. It's like, that's how fun this is. Try to get a movement started by doing funny and crazy things. But also, when we first thought of this tip jar thing, I remember Kat said, oh my gosh, wouldn't it be cool if we did this for college students and all that? And we thought it was going to be fun with balloons and all that. And when people started nominating others and, and hearing their stories and the, oh my gosh, the struggles they went through. And it's like, we got to do some stuff to just help alleviate some of the burdens out there. And it's like, I wish we could give a lot more away because when it hits, and you could see it on their face, when it hits them that, what? The, the burden that I'm carrying is, is all of a sudden a little more light? I'll take it. Hey, in a couple of ways you can, um, can kind of help us get the, the ball rolling. You can take one of those cool yard signs, stick in your yard, stick 10 in your yard. It's a little hard when you mow, but just go ahead and deal with it because um, love no matter what. And um, if you have, we have like only a couple more like bumper magnets, so grab one of those. This is what I do. Like I have a, a bumper magnet on my, my truck, which all of a sudden turns me into a nice driver. <sighs> That's tough. Um, but uh, what I've been doing is uh, I'll, I'll go to McDonald's like three or four times a day and get a Diet Coke, which probably makes me wonder why I can't remember things. But... Um, I'll take one of these, an invitation card, and I'll, I'll pay for the person next to me, you know, next, behind me. And that's, we've been doing that for a long time, but it's kind of fun to say, hey, listen, okay, I'm going to wait till I get a minivan behind me, right? Because I go up and I get like $2.13 for my two Diet Cokes, and then somebody dumps 28 bucks on like seven, you know, Happy Meals and all that. It's kind of fun. Um, and then oh, I, the one time I, I found a guy, he was, he had a Bears hat on, which that's near and dear to my heart, so I love that. And, and, um, and then his wife, and then I could tell there were two kids in the back, and so I'm, uh, I, you know, I, I give him, and I said, hey, say, hey, say the guy did it and say, go Bears, and, and, and I could hear her yell that when I drove away the cashier, and I went, and it's like, yeah, kind of, just, and he, he's like, yeah. Um, so it was just, it was fun. So, so do some fun stuff. Don't drive like a crazy maniac. Do some fun stuff in front of people and, and, and pay for their food. I mean, the, the things, things like that get things started. I, mean, I was amazed to hear what people were doing last week once you said, okay, if we just kind of push this along, see if it gets going, see if kindness of gener if generosity, if loving people won't just catch on. And I think it was a cool. Now, another way you can help, and this is kind of important, I think, um, if you sat down and there's a little sheet of paper that talks about um, Covered International, it's one of our partner ministries. Now, ladies, you're going to really like this. Like, when I do a project, you know, around the house, it's always exciting because I, I try to figure out what cool new tool can I buy for this project, right? That's what guys do. Ladies, I'm going to give you some... Uh, permission. You go out and you get the, your favorite color lipstick, a nice new scent, some mascara, some you know, 
whatever, all the stuff that you do, but also get some stuff for some other people because we're going to help Covered International do their ministry outreach. They go into bars and clubs, um, adult entertainment places, and, and they'll have access to all the girls who dance and work in the clubs. They give access to the bouncers and the I mean they get they get to hang out with people who are in really dark places, really difficult places. And they usually bring them a gift and kind of begin to build a relationship with them. After they build a relationship, they get to pray with them, share the love of Christ with them. And so we're going to pack these little bags, but we're also going to, we're going to help the, the people who go out there on a monthly basis. We're going to have dinner for them and pray with them and, and kind of just encourage them and build them up as they go out into that, that very difficult ministry field. And so what I want you to do, ladies most especially, although dudes, guys, you can get a gas card. You know, that, that feels comfortable, right? You can do that. Um, just don't go get the other stuff. Um, Ladies, you do that. Bring that next week here, and then we're going to pack it at 7 o'clock at night. If you want to come back for that, we're going to pack it. We're going to worship together. We're going to pray with these folks. We're going to have a great time. Okay, now, guys, you're wondering, I'm not sure if I'm liking this church, right? We're hugging. We're crying. We're getting lipstick and nail polish and all that stuff. Okay, I feel you. I'm with you. I'm with you. Because we were thinking about this whole series and how do you get this thing started and, and kind of get a, a movement started. We've been learning about what Jesus has done in the book of Mark, the gospel of Mark. And it's like amazing what he, he will just immediately see somebody in need and he'll go bless them. He'll cast out a demon. He'll heal them. He'll, and it's just amazing how quickly he did. And so this is guy stuff. It's, it's stuff of action. And I thought about that red flag and um, my wife was saying, what's with a red flag anyway? And it's like, I'll tell you in a little while. Well, when we started talking about this, we, we thought we needed like a rallying flag, like a rally point, something exciting. And immediately I thought of Mel Gibson, right? Because Mel Gibson makes all kinds of movies. Uh, actually, he makes the same movie over and over, just different time period. So this one is the Revolutionary War. It's called Patriot. And it's awesome, but it's a battle, right? And Mel is always the hero. Now, I'm shocked at how kind of cheesy this is 15 years later. Like, what, watch the one guy who says... Well, it'll come later, soon. What you notice is the, they're retreating because the battle's getting so heavy, people are retreating. And, and, and he says, Onward, everyone. It's kind of melodramatic like that. But he stops and he grabs the flag. And he says, you cannot retreat from this. What I've noticed is our culture, because of the racial tension, the racial battle, the religious battles, the political battles, like Christians are getting a little timid. We, we don't go out with love anymore. We go out like battling people. And it's like, well, Jesus isn't about that. He's really about kind of rallying around this, this idea of loving people no matter what. And so like, here's what I want. I want it to be Mel Gibson with a ponytail. You know, just See, I don't know if Jesus would be Mel Gibson, but, but I'm sure he's close, you know? So he just, he's calling them. Like, I love it when he bangs the guy and the guy's like a rag doll and he grabs him and throws him at another guy. I mean, I mean, he is, he's the man and he rallies everybody to him. And I think that's what needs to happen in the church because, boy, it seems like we're a bit timid these days, aren't we? We're timid and we're kind of weak. And, and when we go out there, we go out and do battle. And Jesus would say, no, 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 no. You got to go out there with love. You got to love people no matter what. No matter their past, no matter their present, no matter the circumstances of their life, no matter what they've done or haven't done, you got to love them no matter what. Come on, once again. I feel kind of like a lightsaber, but, but, but better. And I, I got to do it slow. Right? I mean, that's where the flag comes from. It's about planting our flag somewhere and saying, hey, we're running that way. We're going to love people no matter what. And over the next couple of weeks, we're going to look at the life and the teachings of Jesus. Now, if you've been around with us for a while, you know that we've been in Mark for a, an entire year. And what we have noticed in Mark is that Jesus is way more awesome than we ever dreamed. 
He loves people in such a way that it's shocking sometimes. He loves people that absolutely no one else loves. And he does it immediately. He does it fast. He goes immediately to heal somebody or cast out demons. It's just amazing. And so we said, we're going to kind of bring together a lot of what we've taught because it's in all the gospels. It's in the life of Jesus. And we're going to take a parable, a, a, a story that Jesus tells, and then an event in his life where he lives out that parable. He lives out that teaching. And so we're going to look at stories that he tells to teach people and then how he lives that out in his own life in hopes of we would start living like that. Now, we're going to start in Matthew chapter 20, an interesting story. And um, it, it's kind of funny because uh, just a few months ago, I, I got my master's of business administration. Ooh, I know. Yes, uh, the reason I got it was so that I could determine that this parable, this parable, this guy is not a good businessman. He is not a good businessman at all. It's crazy. Uh, if you want to turn in the Gospel of Mark in chapter 20, it, there's a guy who is a landowner. And let me kind of give you a, um, a little bit of the cultural stuff here before we, we dive in. Uh, in, in Israel, in the land of where Jesus was, I mean, there are a lot of flat lands kind of down by the rivers, and, and those were used for wheat. But up in the mountains, they, they used the, the mountain areas to, to grow grapes, to grow a vineyard. And so what they'd have to do is get all the stones and kind of they make terraces with it, and they'd put the dirt inside the terrace and so that it would, it would just kind of chunk down the, the mountain. And so working on that place, working in that area would be very difficult because you have to go up and down the mountains and you're moving stone. and you're, So it's, it's kind of a hard job. Within the family who owned the vineyard, there would be family people who were well-trained. They knew how to, to you know, handle the grapes and the vines and all that. But during harvest time, because the grapes would like all ripen real fast at the same time, they needed more people to come into the vineyard to work on it because the rains come in the fall and then they wipe out the grape because they get wet and they get moldy and it's kind of gross. If you've ever gotten stuff from like Kroger or Meyer at the end of the last couple ones, it's like, ooh, they're slimy and gross. Well, that could happen to the entire um, cr crop, the entire vineyard, if you don't have enough workers. And so in this story, this is a very normal thing that somebody would have to go out and get a bunch of workers right at harvest time. Okay, so uh, let's, uh, let's start this. It's in Matthew chapter 20. For the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard after agreeing with the laborers for a denarius, and that's important. For a denarius a day, he sent them into his vineyard. Now, a denarius is a little coin that the Romans would mint and the Jewish, uh, Jewish people would use. And a denarius was actually a pretty good wage. In fact, it was a pretty good wage for a skilled worker like a carpenter or uh, even a Roman soldier would get a denarius a day. If you were an unskilled, untrained, unemployed labor, day labor, who would gather at the marketplace and hope to God that somebody would come and hire you so you could go out and work and provide for your family, if you were just a day labor, the idea of getting a denarius was like, no, no chance you're getting a denarius. You're getting far less. If you got a denarius, which they agreed to, that was like, oh my gosh, that's like a $500 tip. This is great. My wife is finally going to be able to put some meat into that stuff that we eat. It's awesome. Because that, that's kind of how they, they were very poor. They barely sustained through their, you know, very little food and, and hoping to God that they could get a job at least one or two times a week. But these guys, these guys come and the the master of the house comes and says, I will give you, I will give you an entire denarius. They would have been overjoyed. They would have hugged him, kissed him, cried tears, just like the $500 tips. They say, oh my gosh, a denarius. This is the most awesome job. Thank you. So they go out to the vineyard. So they're, they're going out there. And um, it's interesting because after they, they agree and, and they go out and work, the, the master of the house continues on going out. He goes out about the third hour, and he saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And to them, he said, you go into the vineyard too, and whatever is right, I will give you. Now, he doesn't say he's going to give them a denarius. He says, I'll give you what's right. And they must have thought, okay, well, if they got a denarius and we're only working X amount of hours, we're going to get less than that. But that's okay, because we're hungry, and our families are hungry at home, and so we'll take any job we can get right then. And so that happens. The people who at the third hour, they go out, and they're in the, the vineyard as well. 
He goes out once again, the sixth hour and the ninth hour. And so he's getting laborers. And, and this is what I, like, you know, as a master of business administration, I'm wondering, like, why, why do they, does he keep coming back for more people? Like, does he not know how many workers he needs? Does he not know how many people can pick how many grapes and how many hectares or, or acres or whatever land they... Why? Is this guy not a master of business administration? <laughs> or does he just want to keep coming back because he sees people who haven't been hired and he feels compassion on them? I wonder about that. It says that in the 11th hour, he went out and found others standing. And he said to them, why do you stand here idle all day? And they said, because no one has hired us. And he said to them, you go into the vineyard too. Have you ever been that person who's like last to be picked? Um, I, I, was, I always say this, I, I've never been that. No, that's just horrible. No, because I always, like, I get picked for the stuff that I like to do. I don't try to do anything that I don't like. But I, I'll never forget talking to somebody who, like, in junior high and then high school, when it came time to pick for, like, volleyball or um, soccer or kickball or whatever, and they, they got the captains who are really, really good, and then they start picking people, and um, it gets down to, like, the last four people, and you're looking and going, come on, man, I'm way better than them. Pick me. Pick me. And these are the guys who are left there. And I don't know if the master of the house and the other employers know what they're like, but these guys aren't getting picked. And yet this master of the house, he comes back and he picks this guy. He picks these people to work one hour, to basically come and clean up what the other guys have done. This master of the house comes out, I think, because he's generous and he's compassionate. And then verse 8, when evening came... The owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the laborers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last up to the first. And when those hired about the 11th hour came, each of them received a denarius. What? A denarius? A denarius for a day was great for a, a day labor. A denarius for an hour? That's like a $5,000 tip. This is insane. This is irrational. This, this guy's going to go out of business. Is he stupid? Did, does he not have an MBA like me? What is wrong with him? He, and he does, I think, the same thing with the people who have worked three hours and six hours and nine hours. He is like paying everybody a denarius. That's crazy. What, what's he doing? He's going to go out of business. The whole family is going to starve because of this guy's generosity, his irrational, irrational generosity. And sure enough, can you think about the people who had been working all day? Now, when those hired first came, they thought they'd receive more. But each of them also received a denarius. Now, I want you to remember that in the beginning of the day, when they were told, you're going to get a denarius, they were like, what? A denarius? A $500 tip? This is awesome. I'm so excited. Now, they've watched everything go on. They've seen these people come throughout the day, and they realize that they got a denarius, and then after working so hard, they only got a denarius? Oh. It, um, let me ask this question. Do, do you remember the first time that you, you really met Christ? I mean, some of you have, have probably met Christ, and, and some of you may have not, but for, for those who, who have, do you remember the time where, where God revealed himself in a way that was so real and personal and intimate and that, that you went, oh my gosh, there is a God in the universe and he cares about me and he sent his son and, and, and if I trust him, I can, I can relate to him. And do you remember that moment? And, and you were told, you now have eternal life. When you come to the end of your life, you are gonna stand before the father who created you, who sent his son to give his life for you and you are gonna be in his presence for all of eternity. And you thought, this is, 
This is too good to be true. Now, now where are you at now? See, see, this is what's going on with these guys. They, in the beginning, thought, oh my gosh, did we get a denarius? This is the best thing in the world. I can't believe it. This guy is so amazing. He is so generous. And now at the end, they get, what? A denarius? Are you kidding me? They got denariuses. What? We should get... <sighs> it's funny. The story comes out of a context where, where Jesus had just talked to a rich guy, and the rich guy had asked him, hey, what do I need to do to... We, to we, receive eternal life, to inherit eternal life. And he says, well, you got to follow these commands. That'd be great. But what I see in you, you probably need to go and sell everything you have, give it to the poor, and then come follow me. And the guy walks away and he says, oh, no, I can't do that. I can't give up anything. I can't give up. The... I love that stuff. And so he's teaching the disciples and Peter says, hey, <laughs> we gave up everything. What are we going to get in the end? And... Uh, and, and, and Jesus says, well, you know, you'll get all this stuff and eternal life. Like, like that's the best thing you can, you can, you, really? Do you really want all that stuff when you can have a relationship with the living God that will last for all of eternity in his presence and you will be filled with so much goodness and joy and love that you won't even worry about things? Is that really what you feel? See, I think it's funny that we receive eternal life and then all of a sudden we want more than that. And that's what these people have. See, when we stay in the place of going, oh my gosh, I can't believe I have eternal life. Do you know how, how profoundly generous we can be because of the gratitude of our hearts? Having received all of that, I'll gladly give of my life, my time, my resources, my my gifts, anything, anything, because I have received the best, best thing I could ever receive. The master of their house is kind of angry when they grumbled at him. They thought they'd receive a denarius or much more than that, but they just got a denarius and they grumbled at the master. It's kind of a funny Greek word. It literally sounds like... That's how you pronounce the Greek word... These last works only one hour, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, friend, I'm doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for denarius? Didn't we agree that you would come and you would work and you would receive even more than you ever dreamed? And that's exactly what you receive. Those who have come and have worked for, for nine and for six and for three and even for one hour, they are going to receive the same thing. But isn't it right that I can do what I want with what belongs to me, he says? I choose to give to this last worker as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Isn't it interesting that God has to explain his irrational generosity to somebody who's not even grateful for it. Have you, have you ever felt something welling up inside of you to become like irrationally generous? Irrationally generous. I mean, I think that some people have maybe experienced that. Um, it was funny, uh, there was somebody who I knew who was telling me a story about, um, they went down kind of east Ohio, and um, they visited family, and uh, they were having car trouble when they got there, and so they took their car into a shop, and it was in kind of a nasty area of Akron, and if you know Akron, a nasty area of Akron is like, whoa, it's really nasty, and so, um, and she was down there for a number of hours because the thing in her car wasn't really working, and so the, the owner would have to get in the car and drive for a while, and the brakes were like wobbling, and the whole car would shake. And so they were trying to fine-tune that and get that to work. And so she was there for like four hours. And while she was there, she got to know the owner pretty well. And so this, uh, while she was there, a, a woman came in, kind of an elderly woman, with um, what appeared to be a grandchild and her mother. So it's like grandchild, grandma, great-grandma. So it's like a very wide age uh, span and a really nasty car, a car that's barely running. And... And they pulled it in, and the owner and take, went and take, took a look at it and, and found three um, 
leaks in the gas line, in the fuel line. And, and he came back and told my friend, um, this is really bad. Went and told the, the, the lady, and she called her husband. Her husband said, I'm sorry, we, we don't have the money to, to pay for that. You're going to have to just come home. And, and the owner said, oh, my gosh, this is not good. This is fuel, and fuel goes boom. And, uh, and so my, my friend said, is, it, is there any way that, that I could pay for that? And, and, and what happened was this amazing, like, beginning of a flow of generosity just by saying, can, can, can I pay for that? Um, it was like $430 or something. He immediately dropped it down to $300, and, and, he, and he gave her a couple of uh, free oil changes. And, and it was like all this generosity. And then told the woman who just bawled like a baby, oh, my gosh, I can't believe it. I can't. When I tell my husband, he's never going to believe it. Like, why would you do this? Why would you do this? Why would you do this? And so driving away, my friend called back and, and had pizza delivered for everybody at the shop. And, and it's like, just like, like what an amazing day. What, what could have been a very difficult day, boom, instead turned out to be this explosion of love, of gener- generosity, just moving through a group of people. I mean, they went home and said, oh my gosh, that was a great day. That was a great day. That's the heart of God. That's how God does things. That's what he's showing us in this parable. That he is so willing to pour out his generosity on us if we're able to receive it and then to to, to give it away instead of being ungrateful for not receiving instead to be grateful with what we have and give it away. Am I not able to do with, with what I own exactly what I want? Yeah, God You're generous. That's your heart, and we want to be close to your heart. We want to be a a group of people who are sharing that kind of love. Now, it's interesting because he asked that question of the person, and then he asked another question. Or do you begrudge my generosity? Or do you begrudge my generosity? I was meeting with somebody a number of years ago. It was a young lady, and I knew she had gone through a, a very difficult time, a very difficult childhood. She at a very young age, her mother had um, kind of sold her off into the company of other of their guys, and and by a young age she was taking drugs, and and so by the time she was fifteen, her life was really messed up, and um, and when I had met her, she had said not much about what had been done to her, but but what she had done wrong from that. And, and, and when she talked about the things that she had done and how, how uncomfortable and how um, just full of shame she was, there was a level of grace being poured out into her heart that was just so evident on her face. Having received the generosity of, and grace of God, she said, I can't believe he loves me. I can't believe after the things I've done that he still cares, that he has poured out his love and grace to me. I can't believe it. And, and to hear that was just so awesome. And then, um, and then the conversation turned a little bit. It was kind of strange. Um, we started talking about a person that we, we both knew, and, and we both knew um, had a kind of an affection for the gender, the, the, the gender that was a little off. That was poorly done. Wow. Do you understand what I'm saying? Uh, boy, the uh, person was gay. That was easier. And, and I mentioned the person, and, and immediately she said, oh, no, I don't, I won't have anything to do with that. He, he, he's an abomination before God. I won't do, I won't, no, I'm not. And I was like, what? Um. And I started thinking about that. Where did she learn that? She didn't, she didn't learn it at home because I, I knew about her parents and they were very comfortable with any number of people, anybody. She didn't really learn it from her friends because that, you know, in the, same, in the crowd that she ran with, everybody was very comfortable with that. Where did she learn that? In the church. And I thought it was interesting that somebody who had just described the amazing grace that she was shown would not show that to someone else. And I, and I thought, do, do you know their story? Because hearing her story, 
And the pain that she went through, I understood why she did the things she did. And I thought, you know, if you would hear the story of this person, you might, might get a sense of why, why somebody would do things that, that harm themselves and, and could harm others. I mean, that, and, uh, and I thought about this story. That, that wouldn't it be better for us to be generous, irrationally generous with grace and love first, is a story that Jesus um, was a part of, an event in his life where uh, it's in John chapter 8. He's on the Mount of Olives and he comes into the temple area and the Pharisees and the scribes come as well. He's sitting there teaching his people and the Pharisees and scribes have caught a woman in adultery, caught her while she was doing it. And she, they drag her to Jesus and say to Jesus, hey, in the law of Moses... We're really allowed to stone her to death right now. We're allowed to kill her. What do you say? And it's kind of weird. It's like, why would somebody, like, hey, we want to stone her. You cool with it? Is there, is there a grudge there? Do they not like this person? And, but they do that. They, they bring her before Jesus and before the crowd and say, this is what she's done. We want to stone her. Well, you probably know the story, right? He he immediately bends down and starts writing in the sand. And, and I'm sure he just kind of threw this thought out. Okay. Whoever hasn't sinned, you go ahead and throw the first stone. The, 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 the. the old people went first. That's the funny, the old guys. And I think, yeah, I wonder why they know she's a... He stands up, looks around, looks at the woman. Hey, where where are those who want to condemn you? They're not here anymore. Okay, then neither do I condemn you. I want you to go and leave your life of sin. Now, that's different than saying, you need to quit sinning, and, and then I'm going to love you. It's different, right? And, and it's the same way with the 12-hour the workers. What? You're going to be gracious to them, generous to them? No. Yes. Because he was gracious to you. How many of you came to Jesus when everything was, you know, ta-da? I didn't. I don't know if you did. So Jesus says, I would rather start out with this irrational generosity of grace. And when somebody experiences that, when their heart's transformed, when it's filled with with his love, then we'll start working on the stuff that that isn't going so well, the sins that we all struggle with. That's That's how it works better. If you come with condemnation, it doesn't usually get the right results. I've learned that a hundred times over. This Jesus not only tells a story to help us understand that, oh, would you please just lead with grace? He proves it by showing to a woman who should have been condemned and yet experienced the massive grace of God. I don't know where you're at right now. I don't know if you have ever encountered Jesus in a way that's real, it's powerful, and it transforms your heart and I don't know if it, that love has so filled your heart that you now live a life of generosity, of gratitude. I don't know if you, even though come to Christ and you've, you've had transformation in your heart, that you still hold grudges against people. Is there anyone that you would say you hold a grudge against? Is there any group of people that you would say, I don't want them to receive grace. I'd rather have them stoned. And I I just don't think that's the heart of God, right? And so what we want to do is say, hey, listen, let's heavy up on the generosity of grace. Let's heavy up on the love and see if that message won't change the world because it did in the beginning. And people are still looking for it. They still want it. They still need it. I'm going to ask the band to come back up. But while we do that, let's kind of just 
spend a little time with the Lord. Where are you at right now spiritually? Maybe you're hearing for the very first time that God loves you no matter what. That, that he's given up his own life, his life of his son, so that you wouldn't have to pay the penalty for your own sin. Your sin could be taken away from you. That you could walk into grace, abundant grace, irrational grace. And maybe today you want to just trust in that Jesus and start following him. And if you do, you need to understand that the weight of your sin will fall off your shoulders in a way. You'll let a deep, deep sigh of relief as he welcomes you in with open arms.